Hey everyone, this is Eve Picker. And if you listen to this podcast series, you're going to learn how to make some change. Hi there. Thanks so much for joining me today for the latest episode of Impact Real Estate Investing. My guest today is Jennifer Castenson. Jennifer is the VP of Programming at Hanley Wood, a company which serves the construction and design industry through their analytics-driven construction industry database. Based on this information, Jennifer establishes themes and develops content to provide Hanley Wood's audience with up-to-date industry intelligence. As such, Jennifer has her finger on the pulse of innovation in the building industry, and she loves it. Be sure to go to evepicker.com to find out more about Jennifer on the show notes page for this episode. And be sure to sign up for my newsletter so you can access information about impact real estate investing and get the latest news about the exciting projects on my crowdfunding platform, Small Change. Hi, Jennifer. It's really lovely to have you here. You have a fascinating job. I know that you've been on the marketing side of the building industry for at least a dozen years. Is that right? Yeah, for a decade. A decade, yeah. But now, as I understand it, you use leading data or research information from the industry to help establish themes and content for Hanley Wood. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. So that means that you have your finger on the pulse of innovation in the building industry, which is pretty fabulous. It's amazing. It's a really fun job. And it's also very amazing to see the innovators who are behind the scenes and actually doing something to change all of the challenges that are facing the housing industry right now. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about what you actually do. Yeah. So what I do at Hanleywood is uh, mostly programming for our events. So Hanleywood has a number of different publications and mediums, and we have conferences associated with a lot of those that we call branded conferences. And then we also do custom events where we program for our partners in various capacities. But for our conferences, we are very focused on creating a theme and sticking with the theme and finding experts who can deliver the content in the best way who can deliver best practices, who can talk about research, innovation within a certain space. And so I work on those the conference program, determining with our editorial team, what is the right focus? And then I go out and search for, find the experts, and then work with them to deliver the conference at the event. I also work on editorial content. So working with some of those leaders in the industry to write certain material for our websites. And that could be Builder, which focuses on single family, for multifamily executive, for architect, for journal by construction or remodeling or pro sales. So I'm looking at very holistically at the industry and then solutions for each one of those verticals within the industry and how we can help the industry leaders move forward strategically into the future. So, you know, yeah, I was one of the fortunate ones who was found by you a couple of years ago, right? <laughs> so we got yeah, to- so thank you so much for being part of Hive. Yeah, that was great. And how did you end up in this role? You've been, this is pretty recent, right? Yeah, so I'm going on four years at Hanley Wood. And before that, I worked for Organized Living, which is a building products supplier. And like I said, I was there for about a decade doing marketing and sales. And I was working with Hanley Wood and I had been part of the events from a sponsorship and exhibitor standpoint and knew the folks very well. And they recruited me in to be part of the Hanley Wood team. Pretty great. So your world intersects then with, you know, you know, this podcast is about impact in real estate and the building industry is part of real estate. So your world intersects pretty squarely with that as you see innovation emerge. And I've seen that you're a prolific speaker and all, as well as being an organizer and you actually moderate 
panels yourself. So you've touched lots and lots of topics, some of them really big ones like power or affordable housing or ADUs or prefabrication. What theme do you think has the loudest drumbeat in the building industry today? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I really have to think that there are two and they kind of just, like you said, they kind of intersect with each other. I think prefabrication, offsite construction, and vertical integration are the two that I'm referring to. So I think modular and offsite are getting more and more attention. They've been around for a very long time. However, in today's age, they are getting the benefit of new and enhanced technology And then they are extending the benefit to very many different aspects that are really important to today's construction environment. So there's more sustainability factors. There are more efficiency to respond to the need for more affordable housing. And there's also that touches on the less need for less labor, faster construction cycle, less labor, and therefore reducing the time, reducing the costs. And that's just really, really critical in today's age that we're pulling together projects faster and at lower cost to put home ownership or rent in the hands of more people. But then also the sustainability factors, there's less on-site waste, there's less waste altogether. The projects can happen in any type of environment, which is also important because if you look at climate change, we're dealing with a lot of different climate factors. But if you're inside of a factory, then the housing can continue to be built regardless of what the conditions are outside of that factory. So prefabrication, offsite construction just has a lot of different benefits right now. Yeah, I never thought of that uh, that last one. That's really interesting. But still, you know, I, I'm in Pittsburgh and when I talk to some builders here, they still say that stick built is cheaper here than prefab. How much does it have to do with the labor in any particular market or the building conditions in any particular market? I mean, is it really sort of equally efficient everywhere? No. So, and actually, I would say nationwide, you'll find that stick build, traditional build is very similar in cost to prefabrication. However, the time savings reduces the cost. So what the, the hard costs are there and they're probably the same. And sometimes prefabrication might cost a little bit more. And there are actually markets right now where prefabrication is so popular for a variety of reasons, where the manufacturers are able to then bid up and it's the, the costs are rising for factory construction. So there's all those things are coming together. And actually, if you think of labor unions, the costs involved with labor unions, sometimes the offsite construction might help avoid some of the labor unions. So it depends on what kind of market you're in and all of those variety of factors, how many pre-site, off-site manufacturers are there and what the demand is for that type of construction, along with labor unions, the amount of transportation to site, because that's a huge component of it that will yeah. drive up costs. Yeah. But all of those things factor into the cost, but then the type of savings is the real savings. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. So someone might argue that you're putting people out of jobs. I mean, I'm in a heavy union labor market in in Pittsburgh, so they mightn't be happy to hear you say that. No, I know. And it's actually, so those jobs are evolving and it's a real big question right now. And I was, I said, the second thing for me that I see impacting housing the most is vertical integration. So There are a lot of organizations like Katera, and I'm also working with another one in the multifamily realm that's called Cortland, who are trying to vertically integrate more and more and and take parts of the process that weren't together under one roof and make them seamless under one roof. Where So so like what, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but I'm, I'm wondering what precisely you mean by vertical integration here. What is all part of that? It might be different in with different organizations. And the two examples I just gave, it's very different. But Katera, for instance, is bringing in design 
and development and the manufacturing all under one roof. And they're bringing in even more than that because they're manufacturing some of the products that they're using in their projects and some of the software that they're using in, in the design regard. So it's making the process, it's making it more seamless and making fewer connections so that it can happen more efficiently and more effectively. So they're one of the biggest examples of it, but I was talking about Cortland as well. And they're taking a lot of things under one roof that weren't considered before in terms of property management. It's happening That's more interesting. More with more organizations. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So where do you think all of this is leading? Yeah. And I think that it's leading to more affordable housing for one. That's the aim that most people have, most organizations have when they start doing vertical integration. And that was why and how Katera kicked off and creating efficiencies. So it will take some time to ramp up because those, let's say, legacy organizations, the big developers, the big builders, they have relationships that will be very hard to break. If you look at, I'm talking about the top 10 developers, legacy developers, have relationships in all the markets they're building with general contractors. And once they start saying no to the general contractors and start doing offsite construction or doing, you know, changing the parameters of those relationships, it's going to be really taxing on their business. Yes. One, just to figure out how to do it, yeah. um, how to restructure their organization. But two, what will then that general contractor do? That general contractor might go from being involved in 50% of the project to be only having 10% of the project. And so is he going to ratchet up his pricing? So it's the, those dynamics aren't... Or is he going to be innovative and figure out how to become part of the industry himself? Exactly. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully there's innovation behind it. Be sure to go to evepicker.com and sign up for my free educational newsletter about impact real estate investing. You'll be among the first to hear about new projects you can invest in. That's evepicker.com. Thanks so much. That's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, the ramifications of one change kind of towards the top can be huge, can't they? So are there any other than these two, which obviously really interest you. Are there any other current trends in the building or the real estate industry or in cities that interest you the most? There's so much that's happening. And I think there's some really big trends in health and well-being from a living standpoint. And it's going to be a massive culture shift within the United States. We have been looking at housing as a shelter, but we're going to be as homeowners and as renters, we're going to be thinking about our housing needs to be delivering more than that. And that's not only from health and well-being, that's the builders and developers thinking about how to integrate technology in order to do that. So we are going to be able to, as homeowners, walk into our home and think of it sort of as a character in our lives, to be thinking of it as we can have, not only can we ask our house to put something on the grocery list, but we can also ask our house to get us ready for bed. And that is a whole series of things that will be kicked off by a technology that's behind the walls. And that will literally help us get to sleep and have better sleep during the night and therefore better performance during the next day. That is so awesome. And it brings to mind a show I used to love called The Jetsons. Yeah, so- right. <laughs> yes. It feels like we're the entering the life of the Jetsons. It is. I mean, it's there's so much. And you know, years ago I heard somebody talking who was an employee of Disney and he was saying that, you know, our we will have characters in our home, characters who would speak to us. And I feel like we're almost there. Now there's a whole bunch of hurdles with security issues and there's also hurdles in terms of integration and what people are willing to pay for these sorts of technologies. However, we are on sort of a fast track because of the way that technology accelerates. So it's wow, how interesting. interesting. Yeah, interesting. But do you think these trends will make for better cities? Are these sort of really important, impactful trends? 
having yeah, so, in your house? <laughs> yeah, I was talking about health and well-being, and I think you know, health and well-being. I was so, I was kind of focused on it from term in terms of just one resident of one residence. However, more and more people from an urban planning standpoint and smart city stand, development standpoint are working together. There are more and more collaborations, and more people are understanding, recognizing the benefits of collaboration. So you'll see more cities are creating, working with developers or leading organizations in order to change the city and in order to mold it to be not only prepared for the the, the smart city infrastructure, but to have a focus on health and well-being and creating a more strategically resilient community where people can prosper, where they can not only economically, but healthy from a health standpoint. So putting access to fresh food in walking distance of residences, putting more public transportation options in place. And, you know, we are a nation that's growing older. So a lot of folks are starting to think about how are we thinking about accessibility and how are we making that available for this aging population? Yeah, that's really interesting because actually everything you touched on there is part of the change index on small change. I don't know if you've looked at it lately, but those are kind of the key things for livability for everyone, whether they're three years old or 85 years old, right? Right, exactly. Um, An accessible, healthy place to live where you can move around and reach good food and all of those things. I was having a conversation with someone the other day about assisted living and how it needs to evolve. It's, I think there was an article in the New York Times about how broken the system is. Do you see any innovation in assisted living with, or the way that people are thinking about housing our aging population? Oh, for sure. So I think there's so much that's going into that. There are new design guides that are going into that and actually being picked up by certain legislations to that have to meet or building code that are being incorporated into the building code. And then there's so much in terms of technology to help people. I've seen projects where there is technology that can alert a caregiver of somebody who's in a home alone, if they've fallen, if they haven't moved for a certain amount of time, can tell them when to take their medications, can do so much for the aging population, assist them in just living for day to day. And so it's help them technology. help them age in place. Exactly. Well, the age in place, and that's also when I was talking about having the public, the access to the public transportation, when people live that age out of the ability to independently drive their cars, they lose a little bit of independence. And so having access to public transportation or having things within walking distance is really important. And that's why so many people are thinking of community design and not just how, how someone lives within their own residence. Yeah, I know everyone's thinking about ADUs as a way to deal with affordable housing, but I actually think about it a lot as a way to deal with the aging population because when I get old, I'd love one of my kids to have me in an ADU in their backyard. <laughs> that sounds to me much more appealing than a an assisted living community. If there's technology developed that helps keep me safe in that place and able to age like that, that would be amazing, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. They are an option for affordability, but it's also being looked at as a a second home on property that, that could house in an older relative. A lot of people are looking at it as that option. Or a teenager you don't want to see every day, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So the big question is really, do you think socially responsible real estate or building methods are necessary in today's still development landscape? Oh, for sure. And it's actually really impressive that we talk about that change in the building industry is very slow. But if you look at and change in terms of code, all of it has been 
socially responsible, right? So we've yes. we've actually layered on so much code to be more responsible in terms of environmental impact. And now we're using codes and projects and certifications that also like the FitWell program that are focused on health and well-being in in our communities and in our homes. And then we're also taking on codes and we're involved in another project at Hanley Wood that's focusing on reducing the amount of embodied carbon. And those types of things are the responsibility are things that builders and developers are, are, are owning and and they've been evolving very quite quickly over the years and they're taking more and more responsibility for providing housing in a way that is socially responsible environmentally responsible and then that is comfortable and also will help people from a perspective of emotionally psychologically and mentally growing and it's a lot to combine into a home. So maybe eventually we'll become the happiest country on the planet. (laughs) We're far from that right now, right? So we're sort of gradually catching up on some European standards, which is really pretty fabulous. So like my big wrap up question is, where do you think the future of real estate impact investing lies? I was talking about before that we're working on various conferences and the one that we had you involved in was called Hive, which stands for Housing Innovation Vision Economics. And through that conference, we do an honors program that's called the Hive 50, which our editors select the top 50 innovations in housing. And I would say that a lot of the innovations are around finance. Impact investing has had a smaller presence on that list. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity for that to grow. And I think that as more cities and their collaborations come into the picture, we'll see more and more of that happening. You sort of tangentially, you see a lot of organizations getting involved in sponsoring, donating, subsidizing affordable housing construction in various areas. And that actually has picked up a lot in the last 12 months. Yeah, and that is impact investing, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we'll see more and more of that just as we are not able to meet the demand of housing in this country. And we're not actually on a trajectory to meet it anytime soon. So hopefully we see more of that, more of the money coming in so that we can develop the housing that we need. Yeah, yeah. So I also have three sign-up questions that I usually ask because I want to hear everyone's answer on these. And the first one is, what's the key factor that makes a real estate project impactful to you? I think what makes it interesting to me is that it becomes something that teaches the industry, the rest of the industry, and that we can pick up at a volume scale and bring it to more places. That sounds like innovation. Yeah. Really. It's the most important thing to you. Okay. Okay. And then, you know, I have a crowdfunding platform, right? And do you think there's, there could be other benefits other than raising money that could come out of crowdfunding in real estate? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, I think you have done such an amazing job bringing crowdfunding to a more visible level in housing. And that needs to, I, I give you all of, the kudos in the world. And I hope that you guys keep elevating that. It has done a tremendous job to give visibility to projects that wouldn't have made it otherwise. And those projects are the ones that we need more of because they're innovative. They're new approaches to what traditionally or legacy organizations are not approaching because of their capital streams. So I think it's amazing. Oh, thank you. I feel like we're just scratching the surface. There's so much to do, right? Right. And and then this is a really big question. If you want to improve one thing about the real estate industry in this country, what would that be? If I could change one thing, I think it would just be something about regulation, which I wouldn't know how to approach because it's it's such a complicated web. But I would say that there's something 
either to policy and regulation that would remove some of the hurdles and allow building to happen in a more efficient way with maybe some of the responsibilities back on, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. So there's just so much to do there. No, I mean, I think you're talking about zoning and building codes kind of all wrapped up together. And that's a lot of stuff to unravel. I, I know some cities are trying to unravel bits of zoning codes and move things forward in a different way. But yes, it's a lot. Jennifer, this was just delightful. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk Absolutely. to me. And Thank I, you so much. I'm going to call this Entering the Life of the Jetsons. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> okay, have a great day. Bye. Thanks. You too. Bye. That was Jennifer Castenson. She gave me lots to think about. First, she thinks that a focus on health and well-being is having massive cultural implications in the building industry. Second, in the future, she believes that housing will need to deliver far more than just shelter. And third, innovations in prefab may well be a major part of the solution to the lack of housing in the U.S., you can find out more about Impact Real Estate Investing and access the show notes for today's episode at my website, evepicker.com. While you're there, sign up for my newsletter to find out more about how to make money in real estate while building better cities. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. And thank you, Jennifer, for sharing your thoughts with me. We'll talk again soon, but for now, this is Eve Picker signing off to go make some change.